Hello everyone! I know it has been a long, long time, a uh, couple months maybe, but it's me, Nick, the Jaded Book Burner, and I, the reason why I, I'm making this video is because I have to. Um, but just real quick, uh, the reason why you haven't seen a lot of videos from my new place is just because the AC there is like really, really loud. Um, I'm hesitant to make a video, but for now, I'm making this video here. If there's any interruptions, I'll cut it out. I had to make this book review, and it's for a book that I've seen maybe one or two people mention on their channels, but I haven't seen them review it yet. I just don't know if I'm not digging enough. And that book is Hybrid Child by Marika O'Hara and translated by Jody Beck. I just finished this book today and there is so much going on. There is so much to talk about. And um, I learned after reblogging some fan art on, or reblogging, retweeting some fan art on Twitter that Yoko Taro, the creator of Drakengard and Nier and Nier Automata and Nier Replicant, he called this his quote unquote Bible in an interview. Uh, and he would like to make a video game of it if he can someday. Um, and hopefully this. Stuff I talk about soon will kind of reveal those connections, but for now, um, just a brief uh, introduction. Um, this book was actually originally published in Japanese in 1990 and was not translated until 2018 um, by the Minnesota University Press. University of Minnesota Press. Um, it was a part of their Parallel Futures series, which was to translate Japanese sci-fi. They still are translating Japanese sci-fi. I just don't think the Parallel Futures line has been continued. Um, you can still find this book and the other book in that series, The Sacred Era by Yoshio Aramaki. Um, forgive me if the Japanese pronunciations are off. I, hopefully I can get pronunciations right. If not, I am sorry. But okay. What is this book even about? Okay. This book is set in the very, very far future, and it spans centuries, the story does. Um, it opens with humanity is at war with the machine empire of Adeoptron, a a uh, and the Adeoptrons were machines that uh, humanity created long ago, but eventually they rebelled out in space and stuff. Um, and so humanity has gone to war against them by using these creatures called Dadaisms. They are these biomechanical creatures who can morph shape after, um, like, tasting, as you could call it, as the book calls it, or ingesting cells of different living organisms. And um, in the beginning, we are introduced to sample B number three. He, he, it's, um, they call him he, his, they don't really ever state if he's actually a guy or not, but I will actually talk about that in a bit because this book has some, like, gender stuff in it. Um, he was let out by a scientist who was helping create the other sample bees, and he took that uh, scientist's cell, so he disguised himself as him and left. And he eventually um, winds up at a house of an author. Um, I don't think we ever know that author's name. Um, but she lives in a house where the AI is her daughter. Her dead daughter that she killed uh, years ago and then buried her body underneath the house and then put her consciousness, her soul, what have you, as the house's AI. And um, she lets Sample B number three into the home where she takes care of him. And Sample B... Um, tries to communicate with Jonah, the daughter, uh, but he just doesn't understand the house mechanics. And then he watches Jonah and her mother just be absolutely abusive towards one another. And through Jonah's perspective, we learn how her mother eventually spiraled and how Jonah herself's original life ended. Um, and eventually... The military, which is kind of a theocratic military, it's really strange. It's headed by this military priest 
who was apparently born old and is gradually doing a Benjamin Button thing. He's becoming younger as the years pass. And um, the military lieutenant, or one of the lieutenants, D.H., that's what D.H. will be called for now. You'll find out why. Leads an attack on the mansion, or the house, where Jonah and Sample B number three are. And Jonah doesn't want to be left alone. And Sample B number three doesn't want to see the house destroyed. Um, prior to this, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, prior to this, um, the mother died, and Sample B number three ate her, and then turned into her. And that got Jonah kind of upset. And, and then D.H. and D.H.'s military attacked. And then Sample B number three went under the house where Jonah was. Fused with her? Or ate her? Something? Either way, Sample B number three took Jonah's form. Buried underneath the house, tumbled out, and that's just where the story begins. After that, they go to space, like 200 years in the future, to a planet called Caritas, where this AI named Milagros is. And she was, and Milagros rules over the planet Caritas. And she was initially nice, benevolent, cute, well, not cute, but, you know, motherly. And then after some, and I don't know if these are the Adaptron machines or not, they're called Stone Fairies. These stone fairies came and hacked into Milagros's system. Um, from Milagros' perspective, she considered itself a rape. Um, and Milagros went insane, and since then she has tortured the, the people of Caritas. She has let them neglect them and let them die. She does not have any concern for their mortality anymore. And meanwhile, the church on Caritas... Um, is trying to keep the people up, trying to keep them safe. Uh, one of their leaders is Lysia, who keeps seeing visions, and she isn't the only person who has these visions, of uh, this white static, this white light, who they believe is God. And then um, there is Shiver or Mouse, or Shiver, a man with a very dying body, let's just say, who is in a white coffin, a white glass coffin, who eventually discovers Jonah when she comes to Caritas. And learns about her, and I like that is just the tip of it. Um, there is a lot going on in this book, which I think was one of the weaker things for it. Like Mariko O'Hara, she had a lot to say, and she did it with a lot of religious imagery, a lot of little subtle things about gender. So this book has a lot to do with like motherhood and birth imagery and stuff like that. Um, from Jonah and her mother to Jonah becoming a symbolic mother and almost kind of like a Christ figure, almost, um, to Milagros, to even some of the other minor characters. Hi, Duncan. Um, minor characters thinking and talking about their mothers. Um, so, like I said, there's a lot going on in this book, which... There's multiple perspectives. The primary one is Jonah, uh, the combined Jonah sample B number three. Um, then there is Shiver Mouse. And then after that is the military priest who, like I said, is aging backwards. He even meets his mother and tells her that she will eventually give birth to him in the future. Yeah, that was one of the more other parts I'm critical about is the time travel parts with him were very confusing. But, to get back to the military commander of D.H. Um, D.H., when we're first introduced to D.H., um, they're just called D.H., and I actually thought D.H. was a man. But, and I only realized this after they pointed out that D.H. was a woman, Donna Hess, or the military priest pointed out that, there were no he, him pronouns for D.H. Like, it was just D.H., 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 and I didn't realize that. And then, once it's revealed that D.H. is Donna Hess, a woman, it uses she, her pronouns. And I was wondering what the point of that was, but the themes of motherhood in this, like, in a lot of sci-fi, fantasy, speculative fiction, 
whenever motherhood is being brought up these days, it is often from the point of view of a woman who is expected to go into motherhood, expected to sire a child for whatever reason. Like in The Handmaid's Tale, Offred needs to bear a child because of the theocratic society. And in, what was it, Priory of the Orange Tree, Sabron, whatever her name was, was expected to sire a child to continue the lineage, et cetera, et cetera. And we see it from the point of view of a woman who usually doesn't want to be a mother and, you know, her fears of that, you know, or the fears of her body, blah, 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 blah. This book takes it in a different perspective. In this book, motherhood is shown from the perspective of the children, the child, so Jonah, Shiver Mouse, all the other characters. And the mother, the overall figure of the mother in this book, she is a sadist, she is devouring, she is cruel, she is malicious, she is controlling. And apparently in, um, in an article, I forget who wrote the article, I'm sorry, I will put a screenshot up of it, um, who did research on Mariko O'Hara's uh, book on Hybrid Child, uh, they talk about a phrase that O'Hara used herself called maternal fascism. And I know fascism is kind of a heavy loaded word that we have specific connotations to, but for O'Hara, she said that fascism was like controlling people to where they barely could even move. And a maternal fascism is where the mother is so tight, her, her embrace is so tight on someone, they can't live properly. And, you know, you see that with Jonah's mother, who killed her and, you know, went psychotic. Um, you see that with Milagros, the AI, she just has such a hold over Caritas, she kind of forgets how to care for people. And there is one side character, he's a villain, where... Um, Apparently his mother did not want him, and she even tried to get an abortion, but couldn't. And after he was born, or when he was a kid, she cut up his face. Um, and then Jonah, in her own way, becomes a mother. After she binds with sample B number three, uh, Jonah still has the cells of her mother in her. And when she's in space, she... She doesn't literally give birth, but for lack of better terms and for all the symbolism, Jonah gives birth to this dragon-like shell. I think they call it a dragon cosmos in the book that protects her and has the cells of her of her birth mother in them. And after she gets the Caritas, she has to feed her mother, who keeps growing and gets more vicious and violent. And eventually, Jonah has to kill her mother because her mother goes on a rampage. And the book mentions that Jonah had kind of become a mother to her mother herself. Like, not only with the quote-unquote giving birth part, but also taking care of her. And this book, it, it, it's, it, like I said, it inspired Yoko Taro. And if you've played Nier and Nier Automata, is it Automata or Automata? I... I am so sorry. I I love Yoko Taro's work, yet I can't pronounce the title of one of his games. I'm so sorry. Um, but if you played those games and you read this, you will definitely see the influences, the connections, especially with the ending of this book. The ending of this book um, is very reminiscent of... Well, not reminiscent, but I could see an influence with the true final ending of Nier Automata. Um, and if you... And if you know Yoko Taro, you know you had to play the game multiple times to get the true ending. And the true ending of Nier Automata, you know what I'm talking about. That's where you have to shoot the little things in the credits after you... I forget how many times you have to play it, but... And then there's that dialogue about... I forget what the two um, were talking about, but... You know what I'm talking about. Um, but anyway... Just, this book is just like a future cyberpunk space opera -y kind of fairy tale. O'Hara wrote this, I think, starting in 1984, and it took her, I guess, six years to get it published. I don't know why. Um, 
Correction, I think I know why now, I, now that I just thought of it. That same article person, um, person who wrote the article, apparently the book was divided into three novellas, Hybrid Child, Farewell, and Aqua Planet. And I guess over the course of those, um, let's see, 1984 to 1990, over the course of those six years, each of the novellas came out, then I guess maybe this was one big omnibus. I don't know. I haven't looked up the Japanese version of this. Um, and so, like, there were a lot of changes in Japanese society going on, but also in sci-fi. Um, if you've watched anime from the 80s and 90s, you've seen how the themes, the technology, and sci-fi has changed. Or did change. Um... So she is not concerned with fulfilling genre requirements. I, like I said, this has space opera, space opera things in it, but it's not a space opera. It has cyberpunk things in it, but it's not really wholly cyberpunk. Um, it's a fairy tale, like it's a futuristic fairy tale, like uh, Catherine M. Valente silently and very fast. Um, the other criticisms I'm going to give, and this is just me being truthful about the book. I, I did love this book. I gave it four out of five stars. But there's times where Ohara repeats certain obvious facts, like facts that we've already known or facts that you could pick up from context, uh, which goes into a little bit of showing, not telling. And I guess she did that just because it was broken up into three novellas and she just needed to remind the audience. But um, I didn't think into this, you know, into this combined form, it was all those parts were necessary. Um, I don't know how accurate Jody Beck's translation is. She she is uh, an ESL F, EFL instructor and Japanese English translator, so she would obviously know more about it than me. Um, I and I have no access to the original Japanese. Um, but that aside, um, I assume this, this is a fairly accurate translation. I don't know what if anything was lost along the way. Um, another thing uh, is that there were some characters which I wish we had a bit more perspective, like D.H. Donna Hess. Um, I wish we would have seen more from her. We know that we see through the eyes of the military priest as he's time traveling her in different parts of her life, like before she got into the military, when she conceived the military priest, which that was a very weird scene. I will talk about the sex stuff, too. There, there's a lot I need to talk about. But I just wish we saw a bit more because... Technically, in Jonah's perspective, because after Jonah leaves Earth, 200 years pass, and D.H. Donna is dead, obviously. But I wish... the And that's another thing. I wish the two-century time skip wasn't a thing because it kind of... Again, I kind of thought something should have still lingered on... And I don't really like that the military priest was, like, traveling 800 years throughout the future. I wish that it would just been, like, a couple decades, if anything. But other than that, um, and one other thing, there is a rape scene in this book that was fairly graphic. Um, and it, in my opinion, it went on way too long. Um, and... I just want to warn that for those who read this, um, it's a very graphic scene, and I just don't think it was needed. Um, the book has some enough dark graphic things in it, but this book is also just drenched in religious imagery as well as the maternal imagery. Like Jonah, her name is from the figure of the Bible who was swallowed by a fish, and in fact the bo book even quotes... Um, yeah, Jonah 2.10, and the Lord commanded uh, the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. And technically, Jonah is taken into something's body and vomited out. Um, of course, the planet is called Caritas, which is the Latin word for charity, which is a Catholic virtue. Milagros is Spanish for miracle. Um, and there is the church that Lysia serves. Um, and who Shiver Mouse helps work with. Um, Shiver Mouse isn't sure that the white light everyone sees is God. He's kind of skeptical about that, but he still helps out the church because he cares for Lysia. 
and Jonah. He initially cares for Jonah because both their bodies are not normal, but Jonah, due to a combination of her childlike innocence and just being preoccupied with other things, doesn't feel that way for him. She does care for him, just not romantically. And Shiver Mouse does fall for Lysia. Um I wouldn't really call this these parts romance. Like, there's clearly affection, but not traditional romance thing. Do everyone end up together and happy? I won't say. Uh, my facial expression probably just gave it away. And the religious imagery, again, it, it helps alongside the maternal and birth imagery to support this story. Because, you know, the military priest, when he sees the white light, he thinks at first it's him because he does eventually see his other selves when he's traveling through time. Um, like he sees, like when he's like a teenage-ish boy, he sees a fetus at one point, and then he realizes later on, oh, that's me, close to death, quote-unquote. But then the white light he sees, he believes it is God, but whereas everyone else is referring to God as he and him, the military priest believes that it's a woman, and... And that is so interesting, and I was trying to think who the woman possibly was. Was it Lysia? Was it D.H.? Was it maybe Jonah? Because Jonah, she does have the name of a prophet. Um, she does have the name of a prophet, and she is kind of like this mixture between human and not human. Again, the Jesus things, Jesus was hypothetically human and divine. Um, and another thing is, at one point, Jonah... When, as her body finally matures, um, she gets a bit more plumper, and um, she does grow breasts, and she hates her breasts so much, she tears them off. Like, she doesn't go to the doctor and get a mastectomy. She rips them off her chest, and there's, like, just these bleeding red holes on her. And eventually, at one point, um, another two other characters see her like that in a cave. And that, to me, was all oddly reminiscent of the, the apostles looking at Jesus' wounds, like doubting Thomas and all that. And um, the reason she ripped the breast off is, one, she didn't like them, and two, she didn't like growing into a woman. Like, at no point does Jonah ever say that she is agender or gender fluid or a boy, but sample B number three, who is a part of her, kind of, even though he was called, he kind of did not care about pronouns or gender or anything like that. And um, I don't know if O'Hara was making a comment on Jesus' gender, but again, that's just my thing. But um, this was just, um, like I said, she is like this sort of messianic, she's like a messianic figure, a new Eve, which you will understand if you read towards the end, and a prophet all in one. And um, so I thought that meant Jonah was the god figure, which you figure out who the god figure is at the end, and at the very end of the book. And it was weird, and some people may not agree with it, but I was satisfied with it. The ending is bittersweet. Um... So, and, oh, again, in Near Replicant, in Near, Yona is the main character's daughter. Oh, uh, uh, Yoko Taro took Yona from Jonah, um, and he changed it to Yona because that sounded, he said that sounded more like a little girl's name than old man name. Um, I think I've actually known some women in real life named Jonah, but I, dig but I digress. Um... So you can see where that influence comes from. Um, and I think I could see the influences for like 2B and all then from this book. In addition, um, so the storytelling wise, it is jumpy and a bit all over the place. Um, but with Jonah's perspective and Shiver Mouse's and Lysias, there is like a straight, you know, it's going towards a conclusion. Um, Excuse me. Um, again, with the military priest, it's kind of all over the place. With D.H., Donna, it's kind of all over the place. Um, 
And it's all those religious aspects are interesting to me because um, usually religious aspects like Christianity and anime, manga, Japanese literature, um, they're not viewed disparagingly, but you have to remember that is a foreign religion to Japan. And obviously they will do things with it like Western writers will do with Shintoism, Buddhism, Hinduism. And uh, so the religion in this isn't totally disparaged. It actually isn't. Um, there is some questions that God exists or not, but you know, it's it was a bit different to see um, a Japanese book that you know looked. You didn't just you know look at religion like you know it's a obi to the masses or something. Not all Japanese books and stuff do that. They, they don't. But you get my point. If you've seen stuff like, if you've read like Phoenix by uh, Osama Tezuka, I hope I said his first name right, with, you know, Queen Himiko in the beginning. Um, if you've read, um, was it From the New World, Shin Sekayori, um, stuff like that, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, anyway. Um, so it's, this book, I do recommend it. Will you like it? I cannot say. This is definitely not a book that will satisfy everyone. The narrative will be weird. The sci body horror sci-fi sci stuff will be kind of weird. Again, Ohara is not concerned with fulfilling genre expectations. She does explain some of the science. Um, and of course, it's made up science. It, um, but she's not. she doesn't care about that. She cares about telling the story about how the body can defy expectations uh, that are set down. Um, it, she talks about how the family can be formed from different people and how you will be reunited with them at the end. Um, and who knows? There's a. I kind of got from my reading that O'Hara was saying that God is gender ambiguous, non-binary, agender, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I always like it when authors like use like feminist and queer intersections with religious imagery with, you know, you could call Jonah's ripped off breasts her own stigmata in a way. I don't know. But I do want people to be aware of this book and I want you all to read it, especially if you are a fan of Yoko Taro's works. And if Yoko Taro sees this, he probably won't. But if he sees this, you keep making those games. You make those brilliant stuff. Um, I think uh, the one other thing I do want to say, and Yoko Taro does mention this in the interview, um, Ohara's scope in this story is a lot wider than his. He isn't concerned with like where we came from and all that. He is more concerned with like immediate interpersonal relationships and you can see that in your automata with 2b and i think his name is a2 i'm so sorry if i got that wrong and in near with his daughter yona um but you will definitely see the influence you can see where yoko taro got some of his ideas please please do read hybrid child by marika ohara japanese author um japanese feminist author and so please do read it Please, 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 please. And I know some of you might question after reading this if this can even be considered a feminist book. I know this book is dark, and yes, I am a man, a cis man, and that this has, you know, some some of the women in this book aren't always the nicest people, but, you know, not every feminist book, in my opinion, needs to have constantly good female characters. And... And by good, I mean all nice and everything. You know, Mariko O'Hara can go to those dark parts just as much as Angela Carter did, as Tanith Lee did, as Octavia E. Butler did. Um, but again, that's just my thing. Please do read this book, and I hope you all have a lovely day.